so thank you very much, everyone, for joining on today's session. This is a roundtable discussion, which is a co collaboration between YNP and GlamCon. Uh, goal is to take on manuscripts, have the authors join us, uh, go through the methodologies, uh, uh, rationale, design, as well as the results. Have um, editors and editor in chiefs uh, here in this initiative, uh, Pro uh, Professor Ortiz and uh, Denise Falk joining us from NDT and CKJ to uh, give their perspectives on, on reviewing manuscripts, as well as experts in the field. Uh, on today's session, uh, Professor Allison uh, joining us uh, to give their insights and commentary. So today's session uh, will be presented by Dr. Anastasia Rind. Uh, she is from the first St. Uh, Petersburg State Medical University. Uh, will be presenting a manuscript on the clinical and diagnostic features of Barta and Gittelman syndrome. Our panelists are uh, Professor Barkenhoff, uh, Professor of Pediatric Nephrology, UCL Center for Nephrology in London, UK, uh, Professor Ortiz uh, from the uh, Foundation uh, Jimenez Diaz School of Medicine, University of Madrid, and uh, Professor Allison uh, from um, <clears throat> the Oregon Clinical and Translational Research Institute in Oregon. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining. This session is also CME accredited. There are uh, the speaker, Dr. Rent, has no conflicts of interest, and at the end of the academic year, you will receive uh, credit uh, for your participation. That will be July next year. Uh, without further ado, I will give to Anastasia to get us started off. Mm, thank you, Ali. So, I'll start the demonstration. Uh, so, today Perfect. we will take uh, the overview of clinical and diagnostic features of Barter and Gittleman syndrome, particularly based on an article uh, published in CKG this year. Uh, so, uh, Barter and Gittleman syndromes are excessively inherited salt wasting disorders associated uh, with secondary hyperinemic hyperaldosteronism and normal or low blood pressure hyperkalemic metabolic alkalosis. It has specific features uh, such as nephrocalcinosis, polyuria, sensorineural deafness, which depends on clinical phenotype of disorder. We will talk about a bit later. And yeah, it's a low potassium story. Uh, Barter syndrome includes several genetic defects that affect sodium transport in the thick ascending limb. Gittelman in the distal convoluted tubal. The most widely used classification is based on the five known underlying gene defects. There are two antenatal types, antenatal with sensorineural deafness, classic barter syndrome, Gittelman syndrome, transient antenatal barter syndrome. Type one and type two may present antenatally with polyhydramnios, Children are prone to dehydration and growth retardation. This classification includes omim code, genetic subtype, gene locus, and protein. I like this pic from NDT Journal, also published this year. So, Barter Syndrome 1. We have defects in the uh, uh, sodium potassium chloride channel. Barter syndrome 2, defects uh, in the apical potassium channel uh, caused by mutations in the wrong channel. Uh, 3, this is due to mutations in the CLC and KB gene leading to chloride channel problem in the basolateral surface. It is also present in the distal convoluted tubal, so um, so uh, the phenotype can be similar to Gittelman syndrome. Type 4 is caused uh, by genetic inactivation of oh. um, basolateral chloride channels, usually by mutations of the chaperon Bertin. It also causes sensorineural deafness. Type 5 uh, has been assigned to either barter-like syndrome caused by gain-of-function mutations of the calcium sensing receptor. So it is. Uh, 
uh, or X-linked polyhydramnios and transient infantile salt wasting. Method two. Gittelman syndrome is caused by inactivating mutations of SLC12A3 that uh, encoded um, the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter, so NCC, in the distal convoluted tubule. Diagnosis can be incidental, incidental following the finding of hypokalemia on rotten blood testing. The hallmark of hypercalciuria can be associated with ectopic calcification, chondrocalcinosis, clerochoroidal calcification. Urinary magnesium wasting can lead to hypermagnesemia. In the past articles, uh, hydrochlorothiazide tests often mentioned for differential diagnosis of Barter and Gittelman syndrome to confirm Gittelman syndrome. However, in Kaidiga outcomes, uh, this testing is no longer recommended as a diagnostic tool because of related risks, acute intestinal nephritis, acute volume depl uh, depletion, and hypersensitivity reactions. This was highlighted in view of rapid progress of genetic testing, but what to do in countries uh, where genetic testing is not applicable? As an example, in Russia, we don't use genetic testing of Barter syndrome and Gittelman syndrome due to technical problems. So what about clinical findings? It's polyhydramnus, prematurity, more usual in type one and two, polyuria, nephrocalcinosis, often for Barter syndrome type one, two, three, failure to thrive. Uh, what's interesting and is necessary to mention, transient hyperkalemia can be in Barter syndrome type two. Hypermagnesemia in Gittelman syndrome, classic Barter syndrome, tensineural deafness in Barter syndrome type four, growth hormone deficiency and uh, CKD. We will stop on CKD later. Some words about differential di diagnosis. Uh, Lidl syndrome and chronic liquorice uh, ingestion also uh, cause hyperkalemia, but with hypertension and aldosterone suppression. Uh, Lidl syndrome is due to autosomal uh, dominant uh, UNAC gain of function mutations leading to suppression of renin and aldosterone. It presents early in life with hypertension, uh, hyperkalemia, and alkalosis. All the presentation in adulthood has been reported. Lidl is responsive to amyloride or trimteran. Spironolactone is ineffective. Liquorition contains a glycerothinc acid, which inhibits the enzyme that prevents cortisol from activating. Uh, this hyperkalemic metabolic alkalosis can be differentiated by blood pressure, agent of one set, and serum and urinary biochemistry. Uh, about Gittelman syndrome, uh, recently the article was published in KI Reports. Uh, reports. Clinical characteristics of gen genetically proven Gittelman syndrome in the Japanese cohort. In this cohort, uh, diagnostic opportunities uh, were by chance blood tests, tetany, or short stature. In Gittelman syndrome, monitoring the, uh, for external complications is important, including short stature, febrile convulsion, thyroid dysfunction, epilepsy, and cuter prolongation in one case. Among 29 cases uh, with short stature, 10 were diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency and a replacement therapy started. So now let me present the article. If I don't talk like that, uh, Detlef, you can correct me. So, by Chemical and clinical data were analyzed uh, for 45 children presenting to Great Ormond Street Ooh. Hospital between uh, 1984 and 2013. The median follow-up was um, around nine years. 
Patients with antenatal Barter syndrome type uh, 1 uh, were 8, type 2 also 8, type 3 17, type 4 2, type 5 0, and gentleman syndrome 10. So about results. Um, Polyhydramnus and prematurity was seen in children uh, with type 1 and type 2 Barter syndrome. Patients with classic Barter syndrome had the low serum potassium rate and uh, serum magnesium and high serum bicarbonate levels. Uh, nephrocalcinosis at presentation was present in the majority of patients with type 1 and type 2 Barter syndrome, while it was only present in one patient with classic Barter syndrome and not in type 4 Barter syndrome or Gittelman syndrome. Growth was impaired, but within the normal range. Impaired glomerular, uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate at the last follow-up was seen predominantly in type 1 and type 2 Barter syndrome. Uh, so, and now about medications. Medications at last follow-up, it's all about supplementation. So, sodium was prescribed for 14 patients, potassium uh, supplementation for 38 patients, magnesium for 12 patients. Uh, prostaglandin inhibitors, uh, ibuprofen, and more often indomethacin were prescribed uh, in um, 20 patients. Uh, what about side effects? Uh, indomethacin was used in uh, 30 Barter syndrome patients and uh, two uh, Gittelman syndrome patients. Indomethacin was permanently discontinued in three children to develop uh, abdominal pain and one developed excessive bruising days. Indomethacin was temporarily discontinued in two other children. One child developed uh, enterocolitis at 17 age, uh, days of age. The second child developed gastrointestinal bleeding during the first year of life. Indomethacin was substituted with ibuprofen in four patients. Two because of parental preference, one due to abdominal pain, and one who developed septic ulcer disease. Um, the open question is about using of COX-2 inhibitor, especially Rufikacid. I know that in this report they didn't receive this class of drug, and interesting to hear your opinions in roundtable discussion based on experience of uh, using it now. Potassium sparing diuretics, spironolactone, was used in six Barter syndrome patients. In one, it was discontinued uh, at age 15 years uh, due to gynecomastia, and in a second, it was discontinued due to lack of uh, biochemical improvement. One patient uh, received uh, amylaride because of dramatic alkalosis. In several articles, uh, the using of eplerinone as a selective aldosterone antagonist without antiadrogenic effects was mentioned uh, spironolactone instead. Uh, regarding amylaride, it is not registered in Russia, so patients, if uh, they need it, needed uh, this drug, can buy it only in their closest Finland. Uh, so interesting, what is the situation uh, with it in another country? Is it free to buy? So we can discuss about it also later. And uh, my last slide about um, CKD. Uh, so uh, at the last follow-up, uh, 27 patients uh, had a low glomerular filtration rate. Uh, pathological albuminuria was detected in 31 children. In the article, there was no statistically significant association of development of CKD with either hyperkalemia, nephrocalcinosis, or urinary concentration ability.
As we know, in usual, uh, Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome cases, um, renal bi biopsy is not necessary. However, one child with Bartos syndrome, TAT3, developed uh, nephrotic range proteinuria and underwent a kidney biopsy at the age of 14 years, which demonstrated a focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. In article, CKD was more common in Bartos syndrome than Gittleman syndrome. There are a number of possible explanations uh, for this. One possibility is that this is secondary to nephrocancinosis. Uh, the second point uh, is about long-term uh, treatment with NSAIDs is linked to an increased risk of CKD. However, uh, the doses used in Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome are relatively small compared with doses used for analgesia. Moreover, patients with Bartos syndrome have increased levels of prostaglandins involved in the regulation of renal perfusion and treatment with NSAIDs uh, doesn't suppress, uh, suppress this, but brings them closer to the normal range. A third possibility is chronic hyperkalemia, which in rats leads to hypertrophy and ultimately renal fibrosis with elevated transforming uh, growth factor B. But yet results from adults with Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome suggest that the severity of hyperkalemia is not directly uh, linked to the degree of CKD. Uh, the fourth point, uh, stimulants of uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome include chron chronic volume depletion. Uh, there is experimental and epidemiological work that demonstrates a damaging effect of elevated aldosterone levels on podocytes that um, leading to CKD. And the last point is prematurity. It is an emerging risk factor for CKD. As human nephrogenetics uh, is not complete uh, until 36 weeks post gestation, children born prematurely have an incomplete endowment of nephrons and therefore, therefore undergo ex utero nephrogenesis. So, the question of CKD in Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome is likely multifactorial, and therefore patients uh, need to uh, follow up to monitor glomerular as well as tubular function. And in conclusion, I want to say that despite a solid understanding of the renal mechanism, the wide spectrum of clinical questions remains an enigma which require additional research. Uh, and I would like to thank you for attention and give the microphone to Ali. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anastasia. That, uh, this was a great uh, summary and thank you for the detailed uh, review of the study. So you uh, mentioned uh, that in uh, many regions, uh, genetic testing is not readily available. Uh, this study was a genotype phenotype association. From what you learned uh, going through this uh, manuscript, how do you intend to use that information and, and counsel family members uh, and, and your patients on uh, when you see them in the clinic? I'm sure you see the, you see them much more often than as a pediatric uh, nephrologist than I do in adults, but we will talk about that as well. But how do you, how will you use these findings to counsel? So we can only, um, uh, the information based on clinical findings because uh, we don't have the possibility to do genetic testing. It is, uh, of a Russian okay. population, so only clinical <laughs> findings. So we see nephrocalcinosis or hypercalcinuria, and uh, we think about possible diagnosis. Okay.
and is then uh, your therapy, uh, at what point would you initiate therapy or you consider therapy and how do you uh, counsel parents who are probably very worried about their patient, uh, what may be going on and, and what to expect? So, um, more often uh, we use um, the uh, diuretics and also indemitazine, so in Russia. Uh, but of course, uh, we um, uh, talk with parents with side effects, so and uh, possible effects of treatment. Okay. And it's probably what, what parents are often worried about is long-term outcomes in their children and think that have you learned something from the study which may help you uh, convey or counsel your patient in some ways? So uh, based on clinical findings, uh, we try uh, to think about um, um, the um, most possible diagnosis. So, and uh, then uh, according uh, to uh, this, um, based on um, uh, articles, so uh, we can uh, choose the treatment. <laughs> so only like this. Great, okay. So maybe we open it up to the panelists and uh, go, uh, feel free to uh, unmute your uh, microphone and jump in as you would like to comment. But perhaps first, Professor Bartenhauer, um, your thoughts about maybe you can briefly take us uh, uh, through not only the results and, and the implications of it, but from the very beginning, what motivated your study, mm -hmm. how you put the elements together and, uh, and, and, and uh, went about. Yeah, for, first of all, thank you very much for choosing the study. I'm very flattered about this. Uh, so we were able to do the genetic testing, not able to do the genetic testing for a long time as well. We did not have this available under the NHS. And it was only through an EU grant that we recently were able to do all this genetic testing. And once we had all that information, we thought now we can actually do some cohort studies to see uh, what is the prognosis for these patients? Because that's obviously the biggest question that parents usually have when they bring in their child, what's going to happen in the long term. And I very much agree with Anastasia that most of the time you can do the diagnosis on a clinical basis. Because we didn't have the genetic testing available, we had for each patient made a presumptive diagnosis. Which gene is it going to be? What's the diagnosis? And this is almost always correct. Um, so based on these clinical features, hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis, degree of prematurity, uh, and so presence of sensory neural deafness, you are usually able to make the diagnosis. Difficulties between type one and type two, because um, they look very similar. But if you then have this history of the hyperkalemia in the neonatal period, you also know um, they're the diagnosis. So I think to make the diagnosis, you really don't need the genetic testing in the majority of cases. But it helps, of course, with regards to um, uh, assessing other family members at risk and providing detailed counseling for next uh, children, what the risk is, and so on. And if they think about termination, you could do an antenatal diagnosis. And the clinical sorry. information... <laughs> The clinical information seemed very, uh, very complete and systematic. Was it that uh, back in 1984, when uh, your, your cohort reaches back, you were having a registry, a data repository to which you then... Uh, so I actually joined Great Ormond Street only in 2004. So these 20 years are before my time. Um, but there were always clinicians who had a special interest in these disorders. First, it was Mike Dillon. Um, and um, when he retired, it was taken over by Dr. Van Hoff. And then he, when I joined, he took me into this um, and we built up this renal tubular clinic since then. Um, so um, we had these data available and we had 
often DNA samples available. And once the genetic testing was available, then we could actually just um, uh, genotype them often by the time they had already left us. Okay. I might just, uh, this is Dave Ellison, I might just add something here. Um, that I think that uh, uh, Detlef has an advantage uh, in terms of the diagnosis and that um, uh, he and Dr. Rind uh, both, uh, I guess, uh, look primarily at children um, where the diagnosis uh, is not confounded by uh, the tendency for uh, uh, do, having eating disorders. Um, so I think in, in adults, the situation where you're trying to, to, trying to evaluate for Gittleman syndrome versus bulimia, um, it can be much more difficult. And I must say, in, in my own practice, before uh, genetic testing was available, uh, I had a little study doing, trying to use the thiazide test. And, and my sense was that looking back, about 50% of those who presented with hypokalemic alkalosis with normal blood pressure uh, ended up having an eating disorder, uh, either from uh, eating disorder or diuretic abuse. So I think that's, that's not common, uh, as common in children, and so it makes the diagnosis perhaps easier in that group. Uh, I think that for adults, it's, it can be really, really hard. I think that's very important. Thank you, David. Um, one of the for me, actually, key findings of this study was we don't have the, the differential diagnosis, diuretic abuse. I, 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 I don't, that's, I think, extremely rare in children. But we have gastrointestinal disorders, um, uh, congenital chloridaria or so that get misdiagnosed. And one of the key aspects of this study for me, actually, was that you can use the fractional chloride excretion in the urine as um, a good test to see if it's renal salt wasting or if it's extra renal. And in this study, we found that the um, fractional excretion of chloride of 0.5% is um, a good discriminator between renal and extra renal um, salt wasting. Now, Shiwa Lin just published a paper in, I think, American Journal of Medicine, arguing uh, for the advantages of the uh, urine sodium to chloride ratio uh, and showing some very good uh, receiver operating curves for that. It seems like that's probably telling you the same information. Exactly, I would, I would, I would agree, yes, yeah. So, so is that then the cur uh, current common practice that to still use the clinical uh, assessment uh, for primary, as a primary mode of uh, diagnosis rather than uh, routinely doing genetic testing or are places which are by default doing genetic testing? I'm not sure who you're asking right now. In my clinical practice, patients typically come undiagnosed to me. Uh, so. I first establish the clinical phenotype, but I then also will do the genetic testing to confirm. And because also I have a research interest, because if you have a patient with a clear clinical phenotype who doesn't have mutations in a recognized gene, that obviously is a research project. But I think in the future, it will be more and more that patients will come with a genetic diagnosis to you. Okay. Well, we have, uh, uh, the, the, in glomerular kidney disorders, we have, many, many, many opportunities for genetic testing, but often the debate is uh, what is the clinical implication? Uh, of course, for the research purposes, it, it is often useful, uh, better understanding, but for therapeutic triage, it may have, uh, have no bearing in that sense. Is there any, anything with this regard at, uh, at the tubular disorders here discussed? Bartosz and Gittelman? Well, there's the famous case that was uh, part of Rick Lifton's original series uh, of the, di the identification of uh, SLC12A3 as a, the, the cause for Gittleman syndrome, where uh, a, a patient was placed uh, in a psychiatric ward against her will because of the perception that she was uh, uh, using diuretics surreptitiously. Um, and uh, then she was one of the first people who actually found, was found to have the gene defect. So again, when it comes to people as adults to, to really know whether they have uh, an eat eating disorder or have a genetic syndrome, um, to, to me, it is, 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 is a big, makes a big difference in how you approach the patient. Okay. 
and it may be in children. I, I'm not sure. Maybe reassuring, at least not reassuring, but but com but but helpful for parents to know exactly a diagnosis rather than. Yeah, and many of these parents will want to have a second or third child, um, and to be informed about the recurrence risk, um, I think is quite important. Okay. And yeah, so how about how about treating? Uh, you know, the hyperprostaglandin types are usually certain types. Do you do you does that inform your your approach to the treatment with uh, with nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Well, they the ones that we treat with this are usually the ones who present very early with this antenatal presentation who have marked polyuria. Um, and I don't wait for genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis. I, I, I use them straight away. My predecessor, my, Mike Dillon, he spoke about the Lazarus effect that these prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors have on these patients. They really very poorly. And then you give them um, a non-steroidal and they, they, they perk up, they, they just blossom. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable to see. It's quite a dramatic effect early in childhood. And one of the questions that arose from this paper is, um, is that effect lost over time? Because we don't see this, this dramatic change um, anymore in when they get older. And I don't know if that's because we don't dose them adequately then, or if they don't take it adequately, or if there's just a changed physiology and they don't respond to it as well as they did at the very beginning. Uh, a question from the from the chat going back to you know the diagnosis and genetic testing in the adult patients are there any tests that we as clinicians and nephrologists should be thinking about or ordering in some of these patients that we're primarily you know now I know in the US a lot of us are making the diagnosis clinically uh, are there things we should be thinking about and, and ordering in their workup I think if you do a comprehensive panel of electrolytes in blood and in urine, um, together with an ultrasound and a blood pressure measurement. Um, that should give you the phenotype very clearly. Taking David's comments that it will not tell you the difference between diuretic abuse and uh, genetic disorder. Can we go through this approach a little bit in detail, both maybe by you, Dr. Barkenhoff, for children, and by you, Dr. Ellison, for adults? Take us through. So if you have um, one of the key distinguishing factors between type 1 and type 2 on one side, which is often referred to as the antenatal barter syndrome, and type 3, type 4, and Gittleman syndrome on the other side is the presence of hypercalciuria or nephrocalcinosis. So if that's present, it's much more likely to be type... So if you have nephrocalcinosis um, and hypercalciuria, it's much more likely to be type 1 or type 2. But it's not 100%. If you look at the paper, there's quite a few patients with Barter syndrome type 3 who also had nephrocalcinosis. So they can, be, they can be variable. But that's the first thing. Then if you have the Barter type 3 are usually the ones with the most extreme hypokalemic alkalosis. And that's also in the paper. But that's also shown by other series. Um, they have the lowest potassium values. They have the highest bicarbonate values for some reason, probably because two segments are involved, thick ascending limb and DCT, Barter syndrome type three has the most um, extreme electrolyte abnormalities. I'm not taking Barter syndrome four because it's extremely rare. That can be even more extreme. And then if you have hypomagnesemia, um, that would be much more in favor of Gittleman syndrome, but that can also be seen in Barter syndrome type three. And I think, um, in the first instance, you want the blood pressure to make sure that you're really dealing with a salt wasting disorder because you can see the same electrolyte abnormalities also, as, as Anastasia said, with salt retaining disorders such as Little syndrome or apparent mineral corticoid excess. The biochemistries are virtually indistinguishable, but those patients are hypertensive, whereas the salt wasters are hypotensive or oh, normal tensive. So. Okay. And in adults, Dr. Ellison, uh, at what age is the tip off of thinking of, of one should be thinking more about uh, surreptitious uh, diuretic abuse at, or, or 
is it realistic to see a 40 year old patient with new diagnosis of barter so given is like like sometimes we get called by house staff who see a patient with hyperkalemia and everyone is excited about it because it has been persistent for days but <laughs> yeah um i guess i would say that i think gittleman syndrome can present at almost any age um so it's not out of the realm of possibility that somebody will present uh, with gittleman syndrome um, at an older age, on the other hand, what I've seen a number of times is someone who presents at age 35 with a potassium of 2.8, and yet you look back at their records when they were uh, in for a previous appendectomy or something, and their potassium was 4.5, and so I've always thought that that made it unlikely that this was a genetic cause to the disease. Now, uh, that's my clinical impression, not any well-studied uh, observation. Um, but certainly, you know, Gittleman syndrome actually classically presents um, um, after, uh, uh, during or after adolescence for reasons that I, I don't understand fully, but maybe just because the symptoms tend to be milder. And so, uh, so that's exactly when the, the incidence of eating disorders picks up. So um, I think they, they often present at the same time. Um, and that's why for me, that's always the, the biggest uh, challenge is to differentiate the two. You know, there's no, there in, in Gittleman syndrome, there's no nephrocalcinosis to look for. Um, the polyuria is usually much less. Uh, so the other tip-offs that you see as a, as a, as a child for Barter syndrome are often less obvious. Um, you could ask the same question and, and, um, there have been some studies looking at this as what's the age range for the presentation for classic Barter syndrome or, or type three. And that, you know, that has a bigger range, but I think that's, we, uh, maybe Detlef knows this less likely to present at age 40 than Gittleman syndrome. Yeah, I would agree. One question I have for you though, David, the polyuria, do you see that really in Gittleman patients? Because that's in, that's virtually absent in, in children. Yeah, they have no. completely normal urinary concentrating ability. Osmolality is 800, 900, and 1,000. But I always read about that in the adults. Here's what I think about this. I just uh, was talking about this the other day. You know, the, the, classic, uh, the classic symptom for Gittleman's patients is that they have salt craving and that they like yeah. to drink pickle juice. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and so we saw a patient the other day who had uh, 300 milliequivalents of soap in <laughs> his urine per day. So, so that's, that's a solute diuresis. That's not a urinary concentrating. Right. Disease. But the right. patient may well perceive that as the same polyuria that a DI patient perceives. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I did want to bring something up uh, because, uh, because the paper brought it up and it was mentioned uh, in the presentation. And, and I think it's an interesting thing that perhaps wasn't emphasized enough, which is this issue of focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis, perhaps in, especially in type three Barger syndrome. So I had a patient uh, a number of years ago who at age 18 developed nephrotic syndrome um, we, 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 she was known to have Barter syndrome. At that point, it was no genetic diagnosis. She was actually evaluated by Robert Clayta at the National Institutes of Health many, many years ago. <laughs> and, um, and she had, um, uh, we thought she was going to have uh, nephrocalcinosis, for example, as the cause of her, of her kidney, uh, progressive kidney disease, but the, the nephrotic syndrome didn't fit, so we did biopsy her. She had FSGS. Uh, and she went on to progress to end-stage kidney disease at age um, 20 when she was in college. Um, and uh, she got a kidney transplant, which um, uh, both cured her end-stage kidney disease and also cured her Barter syndrome, which was good for her. Mm. Uh, but, but there are several cases of FSGS reported, I, I think mostly with type 3. Yeah. We think that it's, it's more a... A feature of the disease than than a complication of something else. I don't know, Detlef, do you have any comments on that? Have you seen other cases than the one you mentioned in the paper? No, but it's, I, I agree. And the best we could come up with, and I don't really know if that's true, is that this, they are the ones who have the complete short circuit of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So they have the um, consequent hyperfiltration and maybe this lifelong hyperfiltration 
causes um, the FSGS. It's also, they, they don't really have nephrotic syndrome in my experience. They're not edematous. They have large amounts of protein in the urine, but I don't, well, the, the one, one patient I've seen, it was not edematous really, at least not, not, not strikingly. Was, uh, was this patient, uh, Dr. Allison, was it uh, or, uh, treated uh, with uh, ibuprofen or endomethacin, uh, just like thinking uh, NSAID-induced FSGS? Yeah, uh, and, and uh, my memory was, was uh, several years ago that she uh, had been on endomethacin, but I actually don't remember you know, how long that was for. But this, uh, my, my patient was also on spironolactone, um, so this was from before my time, but it's not unusual, obviously, with the Barta type 3, because they're the most extreme. And that may, of course, even worsen the hyperreninism because you're worsening the salt wasting. Um, so that may put them at even more risk for this complication. But this is all speculation. Okay. I have a question on, on the adults. So uh, the parents... Can they be at risk or, or protected from hypertension or whatever, or at risk when they are stressed, like by diuretics, etc.? Is there any counseling for them or any concern for the parents? Well, the parents. For for did you say for hypertension or hypotension? Uh, well, maybe they are protected from hypertension. Maybe they are at higher risk of adverse effects from diuretics. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking. Well, there's a, there's been a couple papers. The first by the Lifton group that uh, that suggested that that uh, that individuals who inherit a single copy of uh, of a mutation in in, e, in either the NCC or ROMK or NKCC2 uh, have lower lifetime blood pressures uh, than uh, others. Um, now those are those studies are difficult to do, and I and and there's been some confirmation, but some some studies have not been able to reproduce that. Uh, they also suggested that their lifetime risk of cardiovascular adverse cardiovascular outcomes was substantially lower, uh, as well as their lifetime blood pressure. So uh, so that I think continues to be the people's belief that uh, that if you inherit one copy of uh, of a salt wasting gene, you're somewhat protected from from hypertension. I don't remember any reports of uh, excess sensitivity to, let's say, diuretic-induced hypokalemia. I don't know. Uh, maybe a question in the same line uh, would be, are there polymorphisms with these genes which confer uh, hypertension, hypotension, or any other uh, not not full blown uh, the phenotype of Bartos or Gittleman, but more kind of a poly, as part of the polygenic risk of disorders of electrolyte acid base and hypertension. Uh, I'm asking uh, you, David, or uh, you that left. I'm not aware of any such thing. I only know the study that David was just citing from from the Lifton group. Um, I'm not aware that this has been identified in GWAS uh, as uh, genes that will significantly in, in, in influence the uh, blood pressure in the general population. But I also must admit I'm not the most detailed reader of those um, GWAS studies. Okay. So somebody so from the... Uh from the chat room uh, raised this question, which I would have thought would have been a, 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 a non-starter, but turned out to be a starter, is how often does Gilman's patient have hypertension? Um, and that's an interesting observation. Um, uh, so there's a report by uh, Fiona Carrot from the UK uh, of, uh, of uh, a surprising incidence of uh, hypertension in patients who have long-term um, Gittleman syndrome for many, many years, and you can speculate as to why that might occur, and I don't know uh, if that's been replicated, but I used to think hypertension excluded the diagnosis of Gittleman syndrome, and it probably does before the age of 45 or 50, but as people get older, it's, it apparently does not uh, exclude that, uh, exclude the possibility uh, 
that the patient has Gittleman syndrome. In fact, there's a possibility it may predispose to that. Thank you. So uh, maybe we can uh, spend the last uh, quarter of the time. I would like to ask Dr. Ortiz and also Dr. Bocknow, so our rationale of putting this forum together is also helping guide uh, uh, nephrologists in training to, to, to come up uh, with their hypotheses and learn how to take uh, their thoughts, their ideas and studies and, 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 and bring them in form of a study out. Uh, this study is an example of one where we have more the tools of genetic studies, uh, correlation to phenotypes, looking at the more databases and kind of taking a crack on these rare disorders which we haven't been able maybe in the past in a more confirmatory way. So can you perhaps, Dr. Barknow, take us from your initial idea uh, and, and, and how, how this study was put together by your trainees, your team, and uh, Dr. Ortiz, I would like to ask you, there are, you probably as an editor see many studies coming to your uh, desk and how you triage and, and uh, give them a priority of, of uh, what makes a good, uh, good valuable uh, manuscript uh, for, for juniors to try to put together and, and get out to the public. I mean, for me, First, uh, it's a very easy question to answer. We always have young people, young trainees coming up and say, I want to boost my CV. I want to have some publication. Can you tell me a nice project that we could do? And we are very fortunate that we have this very rich clinical material. That's not a very nice word. The clinical population here of patients. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so we thought, okay, especially now that we have the genetic testing and can do the uh, cohort stratified according to the underlying genetic problem, um, let's just look at what the um, development of these patients is. Uh, so that's that's a very easy. It's, an, it's not a brilliant idea. It's a very no, no, but, easy but no, that's exactly that's a, that's exactly the intent. But even going further, easier than that, even simpler than that, how to put the cohort together? How to how how do you um, um, before measuring is collecting? So that the collection of these patients, the longitudinal maintenance of your database, and those things. What would you recommend uh, trainees starting out in larger centers, seeing a lot of patients, to put them, maybe even to collaborate because these are rare disorders yes. to, to yes. share them. And, yes. And yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, usually you have a special interest. In my case, it's the renal tubular disorders. And um, so we built up this renal tubular clinic at Great Ormond Street, and I maintained a database from the very beginning of the various uh, diagnoses. If there's a trainee who already has a special interest in that, I would strongly recommend to keep a record of those patients um, that fit this special interest as well, because um, sooner or later you will want to um, have a look at that and, and review and see what you can learn from these data, I think. And Dr. Ortiz, what do you expect to see from uh, studies uh, coming out uh, from such population cohort analyses? Okay. Like so, um, for rare diseases, we usually get case reports. That's the most frequent presentation of, of a report to the journal. And, and I really think that we can learn a lot about rare diseases, not only about the pathogenesis of that specific rare disease, but also how the kidney works on, and we may learn lessons for chronic kidney diseases. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, fan of, a fan of rare diseases. For a case report, we, we, we search that there is some originality to it, that it adds to the understanding of the disease or its treatment. And when we get a, a, a series of cases from a rare disease, that's, that's unusual because they are rare diseases. So this experience by dead left only only he and a few more groups in the world can have it. And it, what was special about this report, it, it was not only the genetic char characterization. I think we are moving towards a world in which, in which genetics will be more and more important in patient assessment. And as it was said before, we will get patients whose main uh, cause for going to the doctor is, doctor, I have this genetic variant, what, that is, what does it mean? So I think we, we should get more and more involved with the clinicians, with understanding the genetics, 
and understanding what can be the genetic, the, the phenotype genotype correlation. And then the second feature was the long term follow up. So, uh, we usually, when we get uh, reports on rare diseases, the, the follow up is usually quite short because authors just want to report their, their experience, usually a diagnosis or presentation or short term response to therapy. So, uh, an almost 10 year follow up. I think we, we can learn from that, not only from the natural history, but also the, the, the relationship between natural history and intervention. And as we have said, as we have seen, there is chronic kidney disease and there are several hypotheses on why that's going on, whether it's a primary effect, it is natural history, or it may be influenced by therapy. So I think there were several features of this report that made it interesting, although the, the methods were, were were very straightforward. It's, there was no issue with the methods. It, it was the, the information that was in there that was attractive to the journal and I hope to the readership. And perhaps as a message out there for the uh, trainees in there, what really will be interesting is the long-term outcome data you get from studying adult patients. So if you have um, genotyped adult patients, that will be incredibly informative to know for me um, what's actually happening to them once they leave me and what's what's going to be with them in 30, 40, 50 years. So that, that would be clearly an interesting paper that I would be very interested to see. And with that, unfortunately, I have to say goodbye because I have to go to another meeting. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Well, thank okay. you so much Bye. for joining. We are also by the end of time. And, and for everyone, reach out to Dr. Barkenhauer with your adult patients. So he will add them to the cohort and you can study them. Thank you. Thank okay. you for joining. Yeah. So, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Allison and Dr. Ortiz, uh, for uh, joining the panel discussion and Anastasia Ren for putting together the presentation, bringing together everyone. Also, thank you very much for Kate Stevens, who unfortunately couldn't join today, but she has been organizing these events, which we will be seeing uh, down the road a few more times going on the uh, next year. And uh, so with that, uh, thank you all who joined. Enjoy your Thanks, day. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. That was fun. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.